Hi. How is everyone doing? So uh, I want to start by saying I have some live demos planned. And I uh, don't know that I've ever done live demos, but I've seen live demos. We've all seen live demos. <laughs> or maybe we haven't seen them. Um, so part of me practicing for this talk today was actually, I felt like I was uh, almost like on a piano, just practicing the switchback back and forth to displays. So hopefully there won't be any um, uh, hiccups and all my tabs are lined up. Uh, but then I couldn't check my email because I was afraid of like, like having an email tab in there. Anyways, I'm um, Jackie Kazel. I'm going to be sitting down probably for most of this presentation because they're uh, recording a video in the back. Um, and that's what this microphone is. You might have seen some of this in some, the other rooms. And then there's another one on my back for you all to be able to hear. Um, so agent-based modeling is what, and Python is what I'm talking about today. Um, a little bit about myself. Um, so I do a lot of work in the community. I sit on the board of the uh, Python Software Foundation. I'm a leader in PyLadies International, which I believe is up to over 70 organizations. We're really decentralized. So, and we had some stats like six months or a year ago, but uh, we need to work on that. Um, speaking of which, if you'd like to volunteer, because <laughs> I don't have time, <laughs> we'd appreciate it. Um, I helped organize uh, PyData DC. And um, uh, I'm an organizer for Women Data Science DC. Uh, I sit on the board of D Data Community DC. Um, and I sit on the board of the Presidential Innovation Fellows Foundation. You heard Kelly Jinn talk earlier today. Um, so I was a former Presidential Innovation Fellow. And, um, and then I also sit on the board of Biteback, which you just heard about during the keynote. Um, and uh, I work at Capital One. So that's why it makes it easy to organize this here. Um, and uh, they're the host and sponsor, as you know. Um, I'm on the Tech Fellow team here, which is sort of like a uh, senior engineering team that goes uh, deep into different areas of expertise and offers consulting, mentoring, and teaching throughout the company. Um, I, I, I'm working on my PhD. Uh, I'm on the 10-year plan, because uh, I've been working since 2010. So this is when I started studying agent-based modeling. Um, I uh, have been working full time uh, at the same time. Um, it's been a blessing and curse. I imagine someday I will look like this. <laughs> so, uh, overview. So I will, um, we're gonna, the order of this talk is what agent-based modeling is about and complexity, just to give uh, folks who don't understand it a little bit of background. Um, a background in agent-based modeling tools, a little bit of overview of the ecosystem so you can understand what other tools are out there, because some of those tools, if you start to do agent-based modeling, might actually be a, a good entryway for you to start using Mesa. And I'll highlight that. Mesa is the agent-based modeling tool that I had written in Python that I'll be talking about today. And then uh, lastly, the future of Mesa. And so what do myself and the other project maintainers uh, think about as the ecosystem for Mesa? Um, so to understand ABMs, you have to understand a little bit about complexity. And uh, there's a great book. There's, uh, at the end of the slideshow, um, there'll be a list of readings. So you don't have to write this down because it includes this book. Um, but this, next, this concept, which is described in these two pictures, I took from uh, Complexity in the Art of Public Policy, Solving Society's Problems from the Bottom Up. And basically, the authors, uh, Coliander and Coopers, probably saying that wrong, um, describe a situation where um, when you, complexity is understanding interconnected systems and in, the interconnected systems are, uh, the interconnected, consider the interconnectedness of the parts versus the parts themselves. The whole is not equal to the sum. So if you look at like the tropical rainforest, if you remove on the left, if you remove one piece, that system could fall apart. As where if you look at like the groom suburban garden on the right, if you remove one piece, it's probably not gonna fall apart because it's this orderly system maintained, I, unless you remove the person who's maintaining it, <laughs> then it'd fall apart. Um, 
but it's more of a um, organized system. The garden on the right is more of an organized, ordered system versus this sort of natural, organic system. This is horribly simplified, um, but this is where this idea of complexity comes in. Uh, this is not a perfect graph, but it's uh, basically a nice way to bring, let's say, order and measurement to what appears to be chaos and to find patterns in that chaos. Um, so, let's, let's, so let's talk a little bit about agent-based models and an overview of applications. So um, these are, this is a list of uh, sort of terms you might have heard related to agent-based modeling, um, game theory related, but uh, in ABMs we want less than perfectly rational agents. Um, cellular automata is a subset of agent-based modeling. Micro simulation, sometimes used in geography to mean ABM, and individual based model is what ABM is sometimes called in ecology. So what is it? ABMs are uh, a computer simulation consisting of agents, individual entities, um, interacting with one another in order to study an overall system. Each one of those entities have their own rules. So. The elements in these, all these models um, and the models that we talk about today have these various elements, space, agents. Um, so space is like the world that they exist in. Agents are the little entities moving around, making decisions. Um, there's a concept of time. And then visualization is in a lot of these, but not always required. Um, so this is the uh, Conway's game of life is the most sort of simplified version of an ABM. Cells live or die based on the number of cells around them. Um, these, these, uh, these rules give rise to emergent behaviors. The emergence behaviors, is, it looks like there's this collective sort of moving away from the center and these patterns that are bouncing back and forth. This is not really an ABM. The sh sorry, the shapes aren't ABM. The shapes are not agents, but the little blocks themselves. So they look like uh, an agent, that collective shape looks like an agent, but it's not. Here's another classic model uh, from 1971 and two versions of it. Um, the left is uh, the original version, and the right is a JavaScript version with happy and sad uh, shapes. And basically, this is a shelling segregation model. Um, the idea behind seg uh, shelling segregation model was that a agent needs so much of the entities around them to be happy. Um, and if they don't have that, each tick of the time, they will pick up and move to a new location. So in the, uh, in the example on the right, you see that that triangle is unhappy. But when another triangle moves in, then the, then the triangle in the middle becomes happy. So why ABMs? Um, ABMs is a cross-discipline application. Um, so I study at George Mason, and there's a variety of people in my department. Um, but you can do uh, evacuation, traffic, flows, customer flow management, markets is a huge one. Um, Stock Exchange did a study when they changed the uh, length of their time tick and how that would affect trading patterns and the impact on the market before they actually pushed it to the stock market. Um, I think they were going from one-eighth of a second to one-sixteenth. Um, and uh, so organizations, you know, risk, so on and so forth, diffusion of information and uh, adoption dynamics. Um, so one of, the, one of the important things about ABMs is that it not just shows you a possibility of solutions, but it shows you the pathway to the solutions and things that happen along the way. Essentially, ABMs can be um, very uh, chaotic at times. And this allows you to see whether this was sort of like an easy transition, a chaotic transition, so on and so forth. Um, so yeah, there's, there's also these ideas of uh, you can have path dependency, um, individual de behavior, you can have memory. So what, what happens when you give your agents, let's say, three time ticks of memory versus five time ticks of memory? And what happens when there's a distribution of memory amongst your agents? Like some agents have no memory 
And other agents have all the memory because they're just really good at remembering things. And how does that affect your system? Um, including learning and adaptation. So you could, that's where you can bring machine learning into machine learning and AI into um, models as well. Um, uh, also, uh, agent interactions uh, can can generate net, uh, network effects that lead to uh, deviations from the predicted aggregate behavior, um, meaning you know you th you have an assumption of what's going to happen, and there'll be some examples of this later. But it's not exactly what what happens because people are reacting to those around them. So um, growing in complexity, um, types of models. This is uh, predator prey dynamics um, in NetLogo. It's a small ecosystem of wolf and sheep and grass. The sheep eat the grass, the grass dies or you know, disappears and then it rebirths again. Um, the wolf eat the sheep and then the wolf, the wolf end up uh, reproducing so on and so forth. When you have too much of one element in the system, um, the whole system gets thrown off, one of the things dies off and then all the rest of them die off. And that is from uh, NetLogo. In a more um, complex agent-based model, um, this is uh, GeoSim. In this, the uh, agents are also collections of agents. So if you see the borders, it's more um, a political relationship that's interacting with other political relationships, which are the, think of those as like country borders or city borders. Uh, and this is built in Repast, which is Java with a custom IDE. Uh, this is uh, where it gets a little bit more complicated doing um, geospatial with networks on top of um, networks on top of geospatial. It's a simulation of uh, displaced. Sorry. Okay. Um, displaced people flows in East Africa um, using real maps um, and conflict and road network data. Um, this, this example takes us from these simulated worlds that we were looking at to real life simulation. Um, this is created in a tool called uh, Mason, which is also open source, came out of George Mason, um, and it's uh, based in Java. And then lastly, um, this one is sort of the most complex you can get. It's a one-to-one -one scale model um, that's being used for decisions uh, by the CDC. Um, of LA. Um, it's a model from uh, Los Alamos National Lab to look at infection, inf infectious diseases um, using census data, clinic locations, so on and so forth. This is not using a tool. This is, um, from my knowledge, hand-coded. Is it? Oh. Okay. Let's see if this works. If it doesn't, then we will skip because this is where live demos go bad. And that's where it went bad. Oh, it's not. I lost my mouse. Oh, there it is. OK. Yeah. I think I don't have volume. <laughs> is there volume on there? Okay, I will, oh, will this one do it? Maybe. I'm afraid this is just gonna blare soon. If it doesn't work, I'll just move on. Oh my God, that's right, that's fantastic. <laughs> we're, gonna, we're gonna get really high tech here. Okay. I might cut this off early too. The universe tends toward chaos. But sometimes patterns emerge, like a flock of birds in flight. But how? 
How does a group of animals, or cells for that matter, work together in an organized way when no one's in charge? Like termites building skyscrapers out of mud, or fish schooling to avoid predators. It's called emergent behavior, order emerging from chaos. And you don't just see it in nature. Enter the kilobot, a robot the size of a quarter developed by engineers at Harvard. What's so interesting about kilobots is that individually, they're pretty dumb. They're designed to be simple. A single kilobot can do maybe three things. Respond to light, measure a distance, and sense the presence of other robots. But these are swarm robots. They work together. The kilobots can organize themselves into shapes, sort of like how cells form into an organ in your body. Here's how it works. The kilobots are programmed all at once, as a group, using infrared light. Each kilobot gets the same set of instructions as the next. With just a few lines of programming, the kilobots, together, can act out complex natural processes. For example, how do a group of identical cells in an embryo develop into different parts of the body? In nature, this is a fairly mysterious process, but with kilobots, you can recreate it. See here how the kilobots start off blue and then start randomly blinking either red or green? Their instructions are really simple. Respond to your neighbors, match their color. But just with that simple programming, they begin to differentiate themselves into red and green sections of the group, a lot like cells differentiating themselves in an embryo. Or here they're dispersing, based on the way gas bubbles spread out to fill a volume. Here, a swarm of fireflies that start off blinking randomly and eventually begin to flash in unison. These kilobots are mimicking the way bacteria find food. That light represents food. See how they're rotating and inching forward, slowly homing in? Programmers figured out how to make the kilobots do this by watching bacteria search for food in a petri dish. But here's the thing. The researchers were then able to make a better program. They revised the software. They came up with a new, more efficient way of solving the problem. And that opens up a really tantalizing possibility because our cells can be programmed too. With the right tools, you can actually go in and alter a cell's genetic code. It's software. With the right code, maybe you could, for example, teach white blood cells to track down and kill bacteria or cancer cells more efficiently. One day, instead of us teaching kilobots to mimic nature, they might teach us better ways of doing things, and then take over the world and destroy us all. Just kidding. Okay, that's, I love that video. It kind of just really sums it up. Um, so let's go into, um, I wonder if I go back here. Okay, I need to close this tab. Oh, I lost my... See, I knew this was going to happen. And move this back over here. Okay, uh, open source to do this kind of thing. So this is from Wikipedia. Um, there are 89 tools listed on Wikipedia that do this. Um, there are a lot. And uh, so when I got started, um, a lot of them were Java-based. And um, I was like, which one do I use? Um, because I really didn't want to use Java. And not, not all of these are open source. Um, the licensing on these are actually quite interesting. There's a lot of, it's free, but strings attached, um, which is usually like an academic free, but if you're a business, you have to jump through extra hoops. Um, and so I wondered if this was one of the reasons why so many of these libraries existed, because maybe the licensing was so restrictive or is these one-offs. 
um, and people weren't adopting each other's libraries. Um, this is part of my re PhD research, so uh, maybe I'll have an answer for you next time. Um, so the three main tools right now are NetLogo, uh, which is, I'm mentioning this because if you're, getting, if you're interested in this, it's a great tool to see a bunch of examples. They have a great example library and it offers a very easy entry point. Mason, the Java one, and uh, Repast, another Java one, are the ones that are um, sort of dominating the majority of, uh, the majority of models that are built. Um, so Mesa, the library that I worked on, um, has two distinguishing factors. Uh, one, of those, one of those is that it's written in Python. Um, and then the other is that it takes advantage of browser-based simulations. Um, I won't spend too much time on this, but I did a bunch of research on what was out there, what was viable, were there folks I could collaborate with, that kind of thing. And because I, I thought, of course, there must be something out there already. And it didn't quite do what I wanted it to do. So then I um, created my own. Um, there are stuff in the browsers. Um, here's two visualizations of how um, agent base and agent script handle the actual visualization part of the an ant simulation, ants getting uh, food. And uh, of course, I listed the one I'm working on, Mesa, at the bottom. Um, so, okay, demos of models. This is the fun part. I'm going to... Okay, so when you, you can't see that mirror displays. Now you should be able to see it. Okay, so um, right now we have a bunch of examples inside Mesa and it ships with Mesa um, and This one is, uh, we have the shelling example, which was the neighborhood one that you saw. Um, and it's, uh, really, it's a really simple setup, but there are um, the, okay. Uh, so you have the, uh, the main files are the model.py, run.py, and uh, server.py. Um, so if we look at the model.py, make this small, bring this back. Okay. So, I mean, if you look at the file organization, all, all the examples, we created a standard. Um, so there would be an expectation when you hit the examples that you'd be able to follow. Um, any examples that you submit back, um, we would expect to be under this sort of um, uh, expectation. So there's a, a requirements file for each of the models. Um, and the requirements file specifically says, specifically lists MESA. Um, we are pre 1.0, so we don't uh, list the, we're not listing the versions yet. Um, so basically the requirements is for everything that you need in this model, you can detach it. While it's in the Mesa project right now, we're gonna move the examples to another repo. So they are completely separate from Mesa itself. So if this project travels on its own, for somebody to run it, they would do pip install requ dash r requirements, and then it would pull down everything it needed to be able to run. Um, it's a little confusing now because it actually sits in the core Mesa repo. But for a model, um, you basically have your, let's see if I can make that a little bigger, uh, your agent class, which creates an agent. They have a position, agent type, because remember, they need to know what kind of type they are to see um, what their neighbors are like. Uh, a step is a term used for a time, uh, a moment in time. Um, and so for each step, it takes these actions of 
um, looking at uh, uh, the, the neighbors and the grid around them to say, am I happy, am I not happy? If I'm unhappy, then move to an empty spot um, or else add to the percentage of happy. So these agents exist in like a, a world, which is the model. Um, and the world has height, width, density, um, the minority population, the mafia pop population. And also uh, we have currently built into Mesa three different types of um, scheduling, which I'll show you an example in a second of the importance of that. And um, also uh, we have a, a data collector built in and a batch runner. Um, so you can do parameter sweeps and collect that data and then uh, analyze that data. So, and then there's also the step on the model. But when you look at, so if I launch the, uh, a notebook from here, in that particular folder, there is a, I wish I could make that smaller. Does anyone know? Can I change the resolution on this? Oh, no. Ah, thank you. That's a little bit better. So you have a little bit about the background, um, but you can actually run your model inside of a notebook and um, and plot out the results of the model. Um, so this shows, this is just shows how many steps it is. So you don't necessarily need the front end version of this. You can run everything having to do with the model, especially if you're doing um, larger data sets uh, or using larger seeds, the, you can run this all on the back end and then use the, mod, the front end for uh, either separate runs or to use as a sort of an example model. Um, it also, uh, you can also generate uh, Pandas data frames on, um, with respect to the data collector and then use that to plot out your happy agents. Um, so this is not like, uh, so this is not like the stuff that you've shown because the stuff that you saw with the grid front end because that's, that's what I'm about to show you in a second. Um, but like I said, this is more if you're doing analysis within the notebook. Um, the batch runner, basically, uh, the batch runner does parameter sweeps. In this particular case, it's doing the uh, range of homophily one through eight, being that do I want um, one neighbor to be like me or eight? And then it uh, runs for a maximum, does 10 iterations, runs for a maximum of 200 steps, and after you do the parameter sweeps, then you can plot out your results, um, which you've collected in the data collector. So, um, so if you do then to run the server, we've standardized on um, doing python.runpy, which launches a server. And now we have our little tool. Um, the, the way this code is set up, I'll show you in a second for the server side. Um, there's a JavaScript widget for the controls. Um, here's the grid. And then there's a chart that'll pop up here with the number of happy agents. I know it's a little difficult to see. Um, and you hit run, and then the agents run. You can control the sort of speed of the, the simulation, so on and so forth. There's some bugs in the chart. Um, uh, and uh, if you look at the code for this, so run um, calls server, and the server is where we have the visualization elements. Basically, the visualization elements are listed here, the canvas element, which you, which was on the left, um, and then right underneath it was that happy element, which was the text. Uh, which is defined right here, just saying pass this text to the front end, and then you have the happy chart. 
um, and the happy chart calls a chart module that's um, been added to our, uh, to our list of set of tools so you don't actually have to do anything on the front end unless you want to make our front end better. And then we would appreciate that greatly. Um, but the idea being that there are these building blocks and that models can be built with these building blocks and somebody who's a subject matter expert can focus on being a subject matter expert and not putting together a web page and but still be able to share it with somebody else. Okay. Um, great. So uh, an interesting thing to note is um, so shelling, the shelling example is a really simple example. Um, we basically went through all the files that generates the analysis and that generates the, um, uh, the server display. It includes um, and it launches a Tornado server in the background. Something to look at is uh, the wolf sheep model in the examples. Um, and the reason is um, it's sort of an example of a complex model. Um, you'll notice the file layout's the same, except for everything else is in the wolf sheep subfolder just to keep it clean so you know that these are the components of the model. Um, I prefer this layout, even if it's a simple one, but uh, some people like to not have to create extra directories. Um, but yeah, so uh, if, you're, if you're dealing with a more complex model, it's a, it's a great one to look at. Now, um, so I told you about I told you about the scheduling thing that we have built in. Um, there's an example example for prisoners dilemma, uh, and uh, does anyone not know prisoners dilemma? Okay, so Prisoner's Dilemma basically says that um, uh, there are two entities and they can either cooperate or defect. If they cooperate, um, if they cooperate, both of them get uh, one, receive like one point. If they defect, they get zero. If they both defect, meaning um, they don't trust the other person, then they, they'll both get zero. Um, if one of them, co if they both, if one cooperates and one defects, the person who cooperates gets twice as much. This is probably not a, yeah, so there's the defection bonus generally set at one. In this, in this particular example, the defection bonus is 1.6. Um, so the idea is, you know, do you attack, do you cooperate, cooperate or do you defect? Defect. So... You know, it's kind of a, the idea of prisoner's dilemma is you have to trust the other person and whether you trust the other person, uh, what is the most optimal way for you to make your next decision whether to cooperate or defect um, from that relationship. And um, the important thing about this is that MESA has various activation schedules, um, which includes se sequential, uh, random, and simultaneous. So this is how um, they're activated with each time tick where agents are activated in the order. Sequential agents are activated in the order they were added to the model. Random activation is where they're activated in a random order. And simultaneous is simulating, um, simulating them all to be activated simultaneously, um, which can also affect the outcomes of the models that you write. And this is really interesting because uh, I'll give you the TLDR. Um, here's sequential activation. Here's the results from random activation. And these are all sort of set with the same starting seed. So they're all, uh, they're all coming, starting in the same place. And then here's the result of simultaneous activation. And that completely changes the outcome in, in these examples. So if you are using this, this is something very important to be conscious of when building um, models and to take advantage of in your testing process with respect to activations. Uh, okay. So just to wrap up, here is um, Mesa. Uh, it's a very pretty drawing. Um, so everything we talked about were models built on top of MESA. 
Um, and then Mesa's underneath it. In Mesa itself has the model, the visualization server, um, the, the browser web page, the data collector, the batch runner. Um, and these slides will be available so you can look at this later. Um, so we talk about all the models using Mesa, but what the real vision for this is, is to create an ecosystem where um, models can be shared. So right now, we're just gonna push those models up. And right now, I'm working on adding uh, networks to Mesa. I have uh, an example. We're not sure yet if that's going to reside within Mesa or to be a library that works with Mesa, like Mesa Networks. That's why it's in kind of this havesies. Um, GeoMesa would be an external library, not inside Mesa, but working um, externally with Mesa because geospatial libraries are heavy lifts and somebody's not using it, you don't want them to have to install it. And Networks uses uh, NetworkX. But then on top of that, you can have stuff like, um, let's, say, uh, let's say a group of SMEs, uh, subject matter experts, decide that they want to create norms with the way they test models. And so then they might create agents and models and a suite of that that inherit from Mesa, but then other people build on top of it when they've sort of done research and say, this is the path forward for this sort of school of thought. So that could lead to something like Econ Mesa. So it'd be Mesa, it'd Econ Mesa on top of it, and then people would build other models on top of that to test under these various parameters that this uh, subject matter expert group um, decided to lay as the foundation. Um, that is not something Mesa would maintain, but it would be for the subject matter experts to maintain and own. Or there could be something like BioMesa, and the biology people maintain that, or some other school of thought or discipline. Um, started in 2014 with two people, now there's 26, 21 were from sprints at various conferences. I can't emphasize how great that was if you are maintaining a project. Um, uh, now we have three core developers. We just invited a new one. And uh, most were not ABM experts. A lot of them were Python experts. Um, we've had a lot of student usage, we've talked to a few government folks who are interested in using it. So I mentioned some of the to-dos in there. Um, one of the important ones is parallelization of models. Right now we are pre-1.0, so we can still break things. Um, we are not planning on it. We don't intend to, but we're not ready to commit until we get some of these other sort of major core things out the door. And, and uh, to get started and to contribute, there's Docs tutorial. Look in the examples repo. Um, examples now exist in the main repo, so if you do pip install Mesa, You'll have to then clone the regular repo to get the examples, but those will be moved out soon. Um, also, ticket number 223 um, is actually standardizing on our uh, package format, and um, you can translate a model from NetLogo, things to read, and the end.